Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gig Salad Green Room Interviews. My name is Dustin Harrison, and I recently had the privilege of interviewing comedic actress Mary Beth Monroe. Mary Beth has played in shows like HBO's The Brink, ABC's Modern Family, and NBC's Parks and Recreation, but one of her biggest roles to date has been that of Alice Murphy and Comedy Central's hugely successful sitcom, Workaholics. Recently, Mary Beth has been cast in two upcoming blockbusters. One is called Downsizing, and it also stars Matt Damon, Alec Baldwin, Kristen Wiig, and Neil Patrick Harris, and the other is called Keeping Up with the Joneses, and it stars John Hamm, Isla Fisher, and Zach Galifianakis. Mary Beth gave us a little bit of a teaser for these two upcoming films. She told us about her path to success, and she offered up some insights for performers who are still trying to make it in show business. So we're here with Mary Beth Monroe. Mary Beth, how are you? I am doing great. Welcome to Springfield. Welcome Thank to the Gig you. Salad Green Room. Thank you very much. And I hear this is your first time in Springfield, right? Yes, I've been here 24 hours, and it's my first experience here in Springfield, and I'm loving it. So can you bring us up to speed a little bit, um, what you do and how you got there? What do I do? Well, I am a comedic actress is usually how I describe myself. Uh, I came mostly from, um, I started in a theater, traditional theater background, um, going to Wayne State University in Michigan. I got a small scholarship uh, from high school um, doing a lot of musical theater. So that's really was my big calling in college. And then my junior year in college, I started cocktail waitressing at the Second City Detroit um, the Second City uh, is an improv political satire based um, political and social satire theater that's based in Chicago, but they had a satellite theater in Detroit. And I was cocktail waitressing there to make extra money. I completely fell in love with improv. I got very close to the cast there. And uh, that kind of took my career in a totally different trajectory. So um, I have a funny story of how I got hired there, which we can get to later, but just to kind of answer your question now, um, from there, I uh, was hired on the Second City Detroit main stage. I did that for about two years, and then I moved to Chicago um, in the hopes of getting on the Chicago main stage. I did uh, a year of touring, and then a couple of years later, I was hired uh, to be on the main stage, and I did that till about 2006, and that's where I really, I think the improv experience I got at both Detroit and Chicago really helped me hone um, my skills as a comedic actress and as an improviser. And so I moved out to LA and that's when I, I ho luckily scored an agent pretty quickly and started my journey there. And it was like a, you know, I had a lot of luck when I first moved to LA, I, I started booking work. So I didn't have too sad of a story of like struggling for too long. Thank goodness. Um, but I think my careers really started picking up the past three years or so of just working more consistently and with workaholics, that was a big break for me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I have a pretty, uh, traditional, um, path when it came to becoming an actor and working actress in Los Angeles. But, um, I think second city and improv is really what inspired me to be where I am today for sure. Fantastic. And I want to <laughs> revisit that cause I want to hear that story about oh my how gosh, you got it's hired. So, it's really bizarre. Yeah, we can get to it. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it now? Sure. Let's okay. go ahead and do that. Yeah. Okay, great. Because I'm curious. You've piqued okay. my interest. So I was a cocktail waitress at the Second City, uh, Detroit, and um, I was working there for probably about three or four months, and I got really, really close to the cast. There was a six-person cast at the time, and in my time of, of waitressing, one of the cast members announced that she was leaving, and at that time in Detroit, there weren't a whole lot of female improvisers um, kind of waiting to take her spot. So the producer, Joe Janes, uh, who just celebrated a birthday. So if you're listening, Joe Janes, happy birthday. Uh, he um, decided to have an open audition where he was going to invite actresses, improvisers to come up and play with the current main stage cast for a couple of weeks. And out of that process, they were going to hire uh, an actress. So I um, was serving drinks one night and one of the cast members, Naima Funk, hi Naima, she's a good friend of mine, uh, she and she ordered some food and I went backstage to bring it to her and another cast member uh, said, hey, you improvise, don't you? And at that time I had signed up for my first improv class. I had done one show that I had understudied oh my doing improvisation. Uh, so really all I had was my theater training background, my college experience. So I said, sure, yeah, I have some experience improvising, kind of 
quasi lying out of the side of my mouth, but also just like flattered they asked me. And so they said, well, why don't after you're done with your shift tonight, you come up and play the improv set with us? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just perfect. be like, okay, and here's your Jack and Coke and here's your popcorn and freeze jumping up on stage. I'm like, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> so I, I did it. I played the set with them that night and it went very well. And I think honestly, just because I was like, I'm never going to get this job. I knew what they were, what, why they were inviting me up, but I was like, there's no way I'm going to get this job. So I played the set. It went great. I remember singing some ridiculous song at a pep rally with one of the cast members about, uh, sex education, <laughs> which went very well. I think I did a good job of rhyming, uh, the word vagina, which actually has a lot of, uh, doesn't have a lot of words to rhyme with. What, what was the rhyme? Uh, I'm you trying chose? to remember. It was like, um, uh, it was either, I think I, I said mangina at one point and <laughs> that rhymes. Yeah. That, that rhymes. It's not really a word, but it rhymes. Uh, and then I, it went really well and I hung out with them afterwards. And then two days later, they asked me to play another set and that went really well. And so ridiculously, uh, a week later, I was hired to be on the second city Detroit main stage, uh, after being a cocktail waitress for about six months. So it was a very bizarre entree into the second city system, which, uh, traditionally is very difficult to get involved with. You have to take a lot of classes. So I had a very fluky, um, entrance into second city, but I'm grateful for it because obviously I got bit by the bug and here I am talking to you that's because a, of it all. That's an amazing <laughs> story too, because that's, that's the definition of make it or break it right I'm, there. You have one shot where you do not miss your chance to blow. Exactly. You've got you only got, one you just opportunity gotta lose in a lifetime. Yo, in that that's moment, Eminem. I just quoted Eminem. Cause to you, you own it. You Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really cool experience. Uh, fluky, but wonderful. Hey, everyone. If you're planning a birthday party or a wedding reception or a corporate event, we have everything that you'll need all in one place. From costume characters to bands to bartenders, just go to gigsalad.com to find out how we can help you book something awesome. I heard a story, correct me okay. if it's not right. Ooh, you've I done heard a research, story research, about Dustin. whenever you were 16 years old playing Annie. Yes. And there was an in incident with some Robitussin. Yes. Oh my gosh, that that's hilarious. That led to drunk Annie. Do you mind sharing this with us? Yeah, is it is yeah. it too soon? Uh, no, oh, it's too soon. Too yeah, soon. 16 years, yeah, 17 was, years later. Yeah, that was what, two, yeah. three years ago? Yeah, yeah, it was like about 400 years ago. No, um, so 16, yeah, I, I got cast in Annie. It was my first lead role in a musical. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of vocal training at the time. And so I was getting laryngitis on top of a cold. And it was leading up to like our first week of performances. And I got through one performance okay. But I just, I blew out my voice. And so they had me on like, I was taking like a steroid and, and all this stuff. And plus I had the cold. So I was like, oh, I'll just take Robitussin. That's a good idea. So I'm backstage and I'm nervous and I had taken Robitussin. And then I was like, I'm just going to take, because <laughs> I'm just so nervous about my voice. I'm like, I'm just going to take one more uh, little cup of Robitussin. So <laughs> one it's one like, more. So it's you've like I'm just doing one. shots of Robitussin <laughs> backstage as like a 16 year old. No one's stopping me. Because that's a party right there. It's a party right there. That's all you have when you're 16, really, you know? <laughs> Uh, don't try this at home. Don't, kids. Oh, please don't try this at home. <laughs> and then it was like, you know, I'm in the middle of the song, Maybe, which is this very sweet little solo, you know, um, yeah. that Annie sings about her missing, you know, wanting to find her orphan parents. And I just remember having this like whoosh of like, whoa, like I am feeling unbalanced and all <laughs> over the place. And luckily I got through the performance and it wasn't like, terrible, but it was definitely a little more loosey goosey and a little bit more like, I think my first, uh, time improvising <laughs> because I was forgetting stuff and, but you know, it went well and it, I pulled it off, but it was definitely drunk Annie performance that both my uh, artistic director and my mother noticed my mother noticed. Yeah. She's like, I told you not to take so much Robitussin. <laughs> you know, and, you live and, and you learn. <laughs> so that was your first experience. Drunk on, on stage. On, no. <laughs> drunk on stage doing improv. Yeah. Which led to a to career. To me being drunk on stage in Second improv. City doing improv. Exactly. So it was perfect. It was all perfect things, training. All things have a purpose. <laughs> yes. One of your best known characters is Alice Murphy. That's correct. From Workaholics. Mm-hmm. How would you describe Alice Murphy to us? 
Oh, you know, I think Alice is just a lonely, <laughs> sad a uh, woman who it, throughout the course of our show has learned has a lot of uh, reproductive problems. <laughs> uh, she sometimes has her period. She sometimes does not have her period. That's discussed a lot on the show, which I think can cause a lot of turmoil in a woman's life. Um, but I think Alice, you know, at the heart of her just really wants to, she's a, she's a hard worker. She believes in, in her position and the company and she wants to get the best out of her employees. She just has terrible hiring practices. <laughs> she's just hired the worst team possible to make that happen for her. So I think if I, I, I also think that Alice had a lost love, I think at some point in her life that just caused her to be as miserable as she is now. But. I think she's a hardworking, miserable, uh, reproductively confused woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to phrase it. Thank you. That's a very good way to phrase it. And Thank you play you. it so well. It's so Thanks. funny. That Thank whole you. show, the, the whole cast is spot on. It's Thank hilarious. You. So good. Uh, where does that come from? That character, whenever you're Alice, where is that coming from? Because it's just so, like, you hit the mark so well. It's. Thank it's terrifying. Well, it's so stern, but it's hilarious at the same time. Thank you. And I hope I, I try to bring a little vulnerability to her too in moments of just like, she's a real person. She's not just a total B all the time. Uh, but I think it comes from, I had three older brothers growing up, which is kind of ironic because I deal with three boys in the show. And I think I learned at a very young age, you have to be tough as the youngest of three three boys uh, of a family of four to kind of get what you want. So I think I learned how to defend myself very quickly. And as far as when it comes to the show itself, I, I tell the boys like they're, cause they're hilarious. I mean, it's very difficult to act up against, you know, the three of them being so funny all the time. And I, I just have this running dialogue in my head when they're like, when I feel like I want to laugh or when I feel like, you know, they're going to make me laugh. I just remember, I just think of like, the worst names and how much I hate them and that my <laughs> life sucks. Like I just stay in this zone mentally of like, I hate these people. I hate them. Oh my God, they're ruining my life. And it just, it's kind of like an inner dialogue that keeps me focused on the intention I have to have to, to play that character. And a lot of the material in Workaholics is improvised as well, isn't it? Just yeah, all of you guys riffing uh, off of each other. Yeah. You know, the boys probably Im definitely improvise the most, obviously. Um, but uh, Adam always says that we improvise 36.6% of the time. <laughs> I That's don't a know. good round number it's for you. It's a really specific number that I always uh, appreciate uh, in interviews to go to. Yeah. So it's about it's, but we, but with my character too, I, I'm very expositional. So I'm usually setting up a lot of the episodes. So I get to improvise like some name calling. <laughs> like I have some fun calling them different types of names. Like uh, Jagmo was always one of my favorites. It's <laughs> a and, good one. Is um, if I, I don't, I won't swear because we might have younger listeners, but um, F Tard was another one that I really enjoyed. <laughs> Uh, but, um, but so yeah, that's where I get to play a lot, I think is the name calling. Did you already have those locked and loaded? Like were those already up there in your mind and you just pulled it out or was Jagmo, that an Alice Murphy I will thing? say Jagmo was my go-to in college. So I always had that in my back pocket. Like I got to bring that out because that was one of my favorite names to call people. But, but usually it's in the moment. Yeah. I just, I let whatever, <laughs> uh, horrible name inspire me or, uh, in the moment. During our interview with Mary Beth Monroe, we asked her to recite some famous movie quotes as her character from Workaholics, Alice Murphy. Alice doesn't use the best language, though, so I will warn you, this next segment isn't quite family-friendly. The first quote we have here is from Gone with the Wind. It's a pretty famous one. So how would Alice interpret this line? Frankly fucked hard. I don't give a damn. <laughs> Sorry, I had good. to swear for that, that one. Was perfect. We had fucked hard on the mind, so I had to say it. Sorry, <laughs> listeners, and I'm sorry. There's a there's a young girl listening. It's really uh... <laughs> that was great. Okay, all right. The next one we have here is from the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. um, Dorothy has just realized that she is no longer in her own homestead. Okay, so the quote is as not Alice Mur Murphy is Toto. I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And, and I would, think how would Alice, say? Alice would just be like, where the fuck are we? <laughs> That's pretty much, I think, how that would go. Um, again, I'm sorry, listeners. It's just I, uh, F is on the mind. The next one we have is from Casablanca. 
It's an old favorite of mine. Okay. Uh, and the actual quote is, uh, of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. And this is a tough one because no one would ever seek out Alice for a relationship. So <laughs> I think it would go something like, uh, I mean, he, he came in, he met me, and then he left me. <laughs> Goddamn bullshit. <laughs> A little voice uh, quaver in there. Yeah, it's, it's, that's that's the Alice vulnerable quiver that Starting sometimes to tear happens. Up. Oh, that's great. Okay, the next <laughs> one we have is from Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mama always said life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, <laughs> I think Alice would probably uh, eat the entire box of chocolates uh, gain five pounds and then still complain that she did not get what she wanted. That's pretty much how that very goes. Alice thing. Very to do. Alice thing. To, sadly, just eating box of chocolates and like a box of wine. Maybe she'd more be like, "Life is like a box of wine. You just got to drink it. <laughs> just drink the just whole drink thing. Drink it up. The whole thing. Exactly. That was amazing. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. For doing that, that was fun. <laughs> so switching gears here, you did. A series of Applebee's commercials, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, I did. Jason Sudeikis, who was the voice of all those Applebee's commercials. I don't know if you knew that, but he, yeah. was, he, was, he did the voiceover for all of them. I actually just got cast in an uh, Alexander Payne movie that I came from uh, in Toronto called Downsizing. That's where I was before I came here. And he's playing my husband in that movie. So it was like a really fun... That's so cool. Uh, I didn't even talk to him about that, actually. But uh, it's a little fun little... Um, twist of fate that we're actually appearing on camera together now. And Matt Damon's in that film too, yes, right? Yes, yes, he is. Yeah, that was it. Was so cool meeting him. He is. I'm obviously who's not a huge fan of Matt Damon. He's, oh, he's an incredible so actor, good. but he's also the most down to earth uh, person I've ever met. Like you, I think we all like see him and go, I bet he'd be really great to just chat with and have a beer with. And he is genuinely that way. Like a family man, super kind. You know, just, yeah, like an everyman, you know, but Matt Damon. <laughs> so what else can you tell us about this movie? Because it's it's going to be a big deal. I'm super excited to see it. It's a, it's a really interesting movie. And, you know, um, I don't want to say too much about it because I think it is something that you're going to need to see. But the themes of it are really interesting, especially for the time in which we live now, where I think, obviously, it's called downsizing. So I don't think there's a big mystery as to what that might mean. But it is kind of about people making choices to make their lives smaller and um in order to save the planet and the reason in which we're we're doing that and um i think where it it takes your perspective and your life and i think your values so i, I just want to leave it at that because it is kind of a complicated plot and right. um when i've tried to explain it to people it sounds very unusual but that's that's what i think is going to make it so great let me ask you this too speaking of mm -hmm. excellent actors and actresses do you have a celebrity crush? Celebrity crush. Well, I will say this. I, I you know, I worked on a movie uh, this pa that's actually going to be coming out this summer called Keeping Up with the Joneses. And it stars Zach Galifianakis, um, Gal Gadot, uh, Gal Gadot, sorry, I always mispronounce her first name, um, who's the new Wonder Woman. Yes. Uh, and this is her, this was actually her first comedy, which was really cool to get to see her. I mean, she's such a bad at this like badass Israeli she was in the Israeli army like she's just this amazing like gorgeous woman so she did a great job and then um Isla Fisher who I've always been a fan of that's Sasha Baron Cohen's wife but she's just uh, a, a doll and so talented but John Hamm was the was the fourth actor and uh I will say um Yowzers. I mean, he is <laughs> so dreamy in person. You're just, he's just this tall, handsome, very chiseled man. And uh, I did say to my husband before I went to go shoot that, I'm like, I would never, you know, there's no hall pass necessary for this, but I am going to flirt with him. If he flirts with me, <laughs> I, I really, I'm not going to be able to resist. So, um, that wasn't even a question. It's just fair warning. It will this, happen. This is what, yeah, I didn't even ask Did permission. It? it was Did just it like, I, he's very professional. No, it right. didn't get flirty at all. It was, it was very friendly, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I think I batted my eyelashes one or two times <laughs> while talking to him. And what's the dynamic between the two of you? 
on set, like actually in the movie. Oh, with John Hamm and I, right? Uh, so that that movie I can give a little bit better of a of a of a description of. Um, so it, it's it's about it's keeping up with the Joneses. So it takes place in like a cul de sac in kind of anywhere America, suburbia, and uh, you find out that a family has moved away and a family is moving in next door to Zach Galifianakis, Galifianakis and his wife Isla, and they're just very conservative. You know, he has a very buttoned up job. And um, you find out these people moving in who are John Hamm and Gal Gadot that they are spies. And as the movie unravels, you kind of are trying to figure out if they're good spies or bad spies. It's almost like if you ever saw um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, uh, True Lies. It's yes. kind of like it's in that world of like action adventure, but in suburbia. And I will just say that you, you, um, that my character and the wonderful Matt Walsh, who plays my husband, who's on Veep, he's fantastic. Uh, we, we kind of give the answer to that question. So I will just leave it up to that. So, uh, I don't interact, unfortunately, a lot with John Hamm, which was a major disappointment, um, to me, just f- flirtation wise. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but I did get to work with Zach Galifianakis, who was, uh, incredible and Matt. So, so funny. oh my God, he is so amazing. funny. And again, one of these people, this is an interesting thing I'll just throw out for people who are listening to like the higher or the more prestigious work I feel like I've gotten as my career has gone on, the nicer and more professional and more, um, Imp- uh, I think m- this importance that people take the work to be just grew and grew and grew as opposed to, you know, and uh, everyone on the Applebee shoot was great. But when I was in my commercial world, I think I met more uh, angry people and directors who wished they were directing movies and kind of this more of this attitude and more of an attitude that you're kind of indispensable. And I feel like as you go up and, and granted, that's just, there's exceptions. Like I, I've worked with amazing people in commercials too, but I feel like the more people get the opportunities, the more, um, connected and excited they are about the work. So the nicer and the kinder they are in order to make the creative process be as, be- as great as it can be. So just an interesting perspective. I think I've learned going through my career. That's so cool. And yeah. that's, that's honestly why. Gig Salad started as well, just so people could do what they love regardless of oh my where gosh. they are in the world. You know, you can work a nine to five and still, you know, if you if you have a dream of being a guitar player or a yeah. jazz singer, you can I gotta say, I don't do know it. if any of your other guests have commented on your space here, but I'm in obviously we're talking in the gig salad space right now and um I, j- I just walked through and I'm like, uh, there's puzzles on the table, like that collectively, <laughs> like the whole team is putting together. And then there's a music room where obviously, like you said, you have musicians that they can practice and there's art all over the walls. And it's just like, I want to live in this building. Like it's <laughs> decorated so beautifully. And I'm just like, I'd be inspired every day. I th- There's like, I I don't know if they actually serve alcohol, but there's a bar and like oh, there's, the, yeah, there, it's there's great. alcohol back there. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's a really wonderful environment. And uh, I think it's great that you guys are realizing that the more you make your employees happy and feel creatively stimulated, the better work they're going to do. So that's, that's what it's all about. And that's what it's about in, in the industry too. As we wrap up here, do you have any advice for somebody who's trying to get where you are right now? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think at every stage of a creative person's life, like you said, you're looking for that moment or that break. And I think you can get very obsessive about it. And I think you can get very focused on it. And it, believe me, it's even happened to me when I didn't get that movie that I thought would be the thing that was going to break me or whatever. And it, it's going to continue happening throughout your career. But the more you can live your life outside of your career, the more you're going to bring to your career. So Learning to read people, learning, you know, in, in being very fo- um, open and aware to the experiences you're having give you more ammo and more fuel to be able to do good work because you've actually lived life. And so, you know, I think we were talking earlier of just like these people who broke so much later in their career, they had all this life experience that they were able to channel into developing a realistic character and, you know, being connected to the material because they've actually have experiences that they can relate to that. So, and I also think if you're focused on just becoming a star or just becoming a celebrity or getting that break to make that great paycheck, 
I don't think you'll ever be satisfied in it because there's always another level to go. There's, and, and, and I've heard from so many actors that I've worked with that are at that level that when you get there, it's, it still kind of feels empty because your happiness has to come from you genuinely enjoying your life. So that would be my biggest piece of that I think I'm, I'm still working on that I think if I would have heard in my early twenties would have helped me even more. Well put though. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, Dustin. This was lovely. Thanks for having me. Thank and good you luck so to Gig Salad. It's a great, great place. Thanks for letting us share this interview with you. If you'd like to hear more interviews like this one, or you'd like help finding entertainment and event services for your next event, just go to gigsalad.com. For everyone here in the Gig Salad Green Room, I'm Destin Harrison, and thanks for joining us. Thank you.